Hello, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. Welcome to the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Today we're studying the first of two parts, John chapter 12. So this is part one today. After the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus at Bethany, several days before the Passover. Jesus uh, makes himself known near the city of Jerusalem at the house of Simon the leper. Lazarus is there with his sisters, and Mary is going to come and commit an act of deep piety and worship that offends Judas and even offends the rest of the disciples in what we're going to be reading. A scandal follows, and Jerusalem is ablaze with controversy as the stage is set for the coming crucifixion of Jesus. So we'll begin reading the first part of John chapter 12, the first 19 verses. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Then said one of the disciples, G Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then Jesus said, Let her alone against the day of my burying. hath she kept this. For the poor you have always with you, but me you do not have always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was in Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not the disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they the things that were written of unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, uh, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for they had heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how you prevail nothing. Behold, the whole world is gone after him. Well, what a disappointment that they might do that. So, in chapter 11, Jesus was threatened with death several times by the Pharisees and the priesthood. And then at the end of the chapter, he went to the city of Jerusalem. But with the Passover drawing near, he comes again toward Jerusalem, stops in Bethany, and uh, at the time, the high priests and their, their representatives are combing the city of Jerusalem to arrest him and bring him into his ministry. So rather than remain in the comparative safety of Ephraim, uh, Jesus takes his disciples and he moves back toward the Temple Mount. And he stops at Bethany. Now, this is about two miles from the city uh, south. Other gospel accounts tell us that uh, in Bethany, he is, while Lazarus, Mary, and Martha are there, he's the guest of Simon the leper. And uh, so here, Mary and Martha 
Lazarus and Jesus and the 12 disciples, they're all there as guests of Simon the leper if you consult other, the other Gospels with greater detail about what's happening here today. Both Simon the leper, of course, he had a miracle. Lazarus had a, had a miracle. They are beneficiaries of the miracle ministry of Jesus. Simon was cleansed of leprosy. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Now, in our religious traditions, we tend to place great store on signs, miracles, and wonders as being instrumental in convincing the unbelievers. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus performed radical miracles for many years, and in the sight of his hearing and what has happened in the, the, the religious elite, it's just provoked them. It did not convince them. It provoked them. And even the ones that are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, are going to cry, crucify him, crucify him in a short while. And, you know, I've seen this in my own ministry in Lake Charles, Louisiana. In my early ministry, we saw significant miracles, emptied out hospital rooms, people coming out of wheelchairs, cancers disappearing, and even had a resurrection from the dead in front of dozens of witnesses, medical school students, as a matter of fact. But the people of the city were unfazed and unimpressed. The fact of the matter is that signs and miracles, while they do happen, they can be unconvincing. And uh, what is the problem? Well, Jesus said in John 6, that no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. Even miracles and signs and wonders won't necessarily bring people. We've all felt the convicting power of the Holy Ghost on our lives, and having experienced it, we also know that your will, the faculty of your will, was very much involved in either yielding and bending your knee, giving your life to Jesus, or resisting and going on your way. In this case, these notable miracles only inflamed the elders of Jerusalem to the point of murderous intent. Now, we don't kill people. If revival comes, the pastors don't get together and kill the person involved in the revival, but what they will do is assassinate them with their words. A man by the name of Larry Lee back in the 1990s galvanized the church in America regarding prayer, had 350,000 people committed to pray in the United States. He was assassinated by his critics. And within a matter of, of months, with just maybe just a few years, uh, his ministry with a church of over 5,000 people in Rockwall, Texas, his ministry just totally evaporated in spite of signs, miracles, wonders, tremendous making an impact. Uh, leaders don't like excitement that does not underwrite their authority. And you need to remember that. And they'll say, oh, I just want to minister to a few wounded sheep. Yeah, right. Watch what they do. Uh, at this supper, Martha is serving, as was her custom, and uh, so that tells us why is Mar Mary and Martha serving when it's Simon the leper's house. It's because he was not necessarily a man of means. He didn't have servants and he didn't have a wife necessarily to assist in these matters of hospitality. So Mary and Martha, and particularly Martha, are helping. And he, of course, Lazarus and Jesus, the 12 disciples. Martha is serving and Mary is apparently not holding up her end again, as happened previously at their own house when Martha complained. Uh, so she can't find Mary. And can you imagine what, that Martha was again frustrated with Mary? Where is Mary? Where is Mary? Here's Martha serving in a strange house in a kitchen not her own, taking care of at least 15 house guests, perhaps more. And so it's, it's a it's a picture of something. It's this fellowship of this gathering that must have been compelling. The early church patterned what they did for 300 years, of that, this type of gathering. The church met in homes. They met in domestic settings rather than being a part of the culture that gathered at the temple. They've been gathering at the temple for six centuries. Uh, but the early believers notably shunned that idea because they saw the power of what Jesus was doing usually happened in a domestic setting. 
rather than in buildings and places of public gathering. The change from house churches to special meeting houses only came about 300 years later under Constantine when Constantine threatened under pain of death that house churches had to be discontinued. In fact, Constantine did put house church pastors to death uh, because all the believers were required to gather into compulsory gatherings at the bishop's house that the emperor uh, Constantine had specifically appointed. And when the early church looked, they saw Jesus gathering at home, so that's what they were doing. Now, one can question whether the end of the practice of meeting in homes around meals of fellowship was a good thing for the cause of Christ or not. In the three centuries that they gathered together in homes, they brought the empire of Rome to its knees at the foot of the cross. In the three centuries after the end of the practice of gathering in homes, the church and the world was plunged, were plunged into the dark ages that were only broken by the dawning of the Reformation centuries later. Now back to our narrative. Martha's still preparing the meal in Simon the leper's house. We know from other gospel accounts. Mary disappears from the kitchen, as it were, and then she shows back up. She comes to Jesus in front of all the guests and she anoints Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair. Can you imagine the scene so dramatically charged by this sacrificial and personal and very intimate act of Mary, a single woman, upon Jesus, a single man, and the ointment she lavished upon Jesus, we understand, was worth a year's wages at that time. The fact that Mary, being a woman, acting publicly upon Jesus in this fashion would no doubt have seemed very inappropriate on several levels to those present, not to mention the financial waste, the loss, the waste of the ointment. Again, this is like taking a year's wages from the bank and burning it in a fireplace. The waste of the ointment had a significant effect upon Judas. And of course, Judas was responsible for managing the finances of Jesus' ministry. In other gospel accounts, if you go read, check the other gospels, Judas wasn't the only one upset. The other disciples were likewise offended. But for Judas, the handling of the finances in this way was a tipping point. This solidified his intent to betray Jesus. How many times does this kind of thing play out in ministry situations? Have you ever been offended by how spiritual leaders handle finances? It wasn't just Judas who was in jeopardy here. All of the disciples, all of them were offended. The enemy was working to turn every one of them into betrayers of Christ. And the occasion was this worshipful generosity of this unique and this rare woman called Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Now, how will Jesus handle the crisis brought on by Mary's act of worship? Will he commission an outside auditor to go over the books to show his followers that the money is properly being handled? That's what Larry Lee did and it destroyed his ministry. Will he pay back the cost of Mary's gift so that the 501c3 status of the ministry will remain intact? We really need to pause and learn from this incident. Jesus' ministry was not an impoverished institution that had nothing wherewith it could sustain itself. It is known that Jesus didn't wear rags. It is also known by inference that Jesus' ministry not only took care of him, but took care of 12 men and their families, many of whom had been pretty well off, had been wealthy businessmen when they left all and followed him. You don't think Jesus left the wives and children of the 12 to fend for themselves, do you? Certainly not. Jesus took care of them during the three and a half years of his ministry. Now, when Jesus deals with these offended people around him, he doesn't 
tamp down the controversy. He commands them sharply to leave Mary alone. Can you see her cowering at the feet of Jesus? Her hair is, is soaked with the ointment still glistening on Jesus' feet. She's looking over her shoulder with her, her hands on Jesus' feet at the glaring disciples, offended by what they saw as a wanton and injudicious act on Mary's part. Jesus doesn't flinch. He doesn't yield to their criticism, but he defends Mary, insisting that the top priority is not caring for the poor. He says it plainly in this instance. Because why? The poor, he maintains, are always with us. But he would not always be with them. <clears throat> That's very sobering. It should change our thinking about our own giving habits and our attitudes toward the liberality or lack thereof in ourselves and others. In verse 9, we see that this scandal provoked by Mary spreads like wildfire through Bethany and it reaches the city of Jerusalem. If you want to be on the evening news, just let something come to light about the finances of your ministry. And it was a ministry that, for the most part, the leadership didn't approve of. And what's happening? They're provoked because it's exposing the idolatry of the people in the counting houses of religious greed. The critics and the naysayers are trying to find Jesus. The chief priests are now solidifying their plans to put Jesus to death. Now that, of course, they know he's back in the area. He had went to Ephraim, came to Bethany, he's on his way to Jerusalem. Others were coming out to see Lazarus like a religious oddity, a curiosity they'd heard he was raised from the dead. Simon the leper's house has turned into a veritable religious sideshow. But in the midst of it yet, there were those, verse 11, it says, many who believed on him who had previously been unconvinced, yet many of those were those that cried, crucify him, crucify him, just a few days later. Can you imagine the scandal being the occasion of winning many to Christ in our own culture? This incident was such a conflagration that those that su were supporting Jesus were eclipsed by the anger even among Jesus' most intimate followers. So what a mixture we see happening here. The next day, Jesus leaves Bethany and he enters the city at the Mount of Olives. Now, the route he would have taken, he would have come over the rise of the Mount of Olives and seen the temple shining in the sun. In fact, he's seen the king's gate looking directly at the eastern gate. He would have uh, came down the eastern slope of Olivet past the, the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, the people are meeting him with palm branches and praises, crying Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of Kings as he came off the mountain. And, of course, they are willing to proclaim him king if he will do what they expect him to do, but because he doesn't, they're going to reject him. And this is all in fulfillment of Scripture, his triumphal entrance into the city. Verse 16 tells us that uh, his disciples didn't put all this together. They weren't sitting there always saying this is fulfilling scripture. But later on, after the resurrection and after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, all these things came back to them and became clear as fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. The people are worshiping. They're extolling Jesus as he enters the city. While the Pharisees, of course, in concert with the high priest, they are frustrated beyond words and in spite of all their criticisms and their denunciations of Christ they're facing the fact that they're prevailing nothing the whole world they said has gone after him would that the whole world would go after Christ uh, were it not for the necessity of the cross at this point and Jesus sacrifice for the sins of the world all of Judaism perhaps and all of that religious system was just on the brink of just fracturing being confronted by the purity and the power and the presence of Jesus. Can you imagine the upheaval? Jesus is moving toward the temple. The crowds are pressing in to touch him. They're laying palm fronds before him and their coats before him in veneration. Uh, 
Many of them with no get doubt have caught the lingering odor of the spikenard that Mary poured out upon him, still on his feet and on his clothes. Judas has disappeared. He's making his way around the Temple Mount to the houses to, of the high priest to demand, which would have been to the West, and to demand his ransom for Jesus' life. And all the world at this point literally is taking a deep breath and a definitive pause before the horrific and final act of Jesus giving himself for the sins of man in order to open the door of salvation for you and I. God bless you. We will conclude this part two of this study of John 12 tomorrow.